Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Dr. Pamela Schaff, and I am the director of the Humanities, Ethics, Economics, Art, and Law program, that, or the HEAL program here at CAC. And this is our first uh, art event of the 2019-2020 academic year, and we're delighted to see all of you here. Um, this is the first time we're in Mayer Auditorium. For those of you who have attended our events in the past, they've always taken place in the Hoyt Gallery where the art is exhibited. But we have um, been the victims of our own success. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see so many of you, but um, the fire marshal doesn't appreciate us being in the gallery space with so many people. So um, we hope that you got a chance to look at the art before you came, and I hope that you'll continue to enjoy it. And we'll also have projections of the art while, um, during our discussion. I want to um, especially welcome our first year students. Um, you're the most important members of the audience here today, since our artists' work is actually tied to your study of genetics, um, which are some of what you're studying this first block um, in your first, I think, day, official day of medical school, right? Welcome. And um, you'll learn more year one students um, as we progress but, about the HEAL program. But for now, let me just say that um, HEAL is an integrating feature across all four years of our curriculum. And it's delivered in both the preclinical and clinical coursework that you'll have, as well as in some electives and workshops and events that feature um, speakers whose expertise is in uh, other disciplines like humanities and ethics and art. The, uh, performing and, and uh, other arts. And of course, HEAL um, brings you today's art event discussion with uh, Rosalind Fisher, who Ted will introduce um, in a moment, and uh, Ted Meyer, who is our artist in residence, for those who of you who haven't met him, and Dr. Hasia, who I think you all know uh, in the first year class, but he is um, the associate, an associate professor of biochemistry and molecular medicine, and he's the chair of the FMS-1 system that our year one students are in right now. And this um, discussion and exhibit is part of our of HEAL's mission to align the work of artist patients um, with our core medical school curriculum in order to foster enhanced understanding between patients and future health professionals. Um, I want to just say a quick word about Rosalind Fisher's work. I first came across her work in my favorite blog, which is called Brain Pickings, if any of you know it. Um, it's awesome. If you don't, check it out. Uh, Maria Popova puts together in a, a, just an astounding um, collection of things about uh, too many things to mention. But I saw um, Rosalind's work and uh, fell in love with it and decided to get, um, in a moment you'll understand why, to get a bit of her work for um, Ted as a gift. And it turns out Ted already knew her and knew all about her. So um, that was fun. But anyway, Ted, would you please um, introduce Rosalind and get us started. Thank you. I am pleased to introduce her. Um, we, we actually sort of fit in this subject very well because we both have a rare genetic illness, which is one of the reasons we decided to uh, pair with this great doctor here. So uh, Rosalind and I actually met years and years ago while getting infusions at Cedar sinai and it turned out we both did art. So here she is years later uh, showing us this great art. But before we start with that, I have a couple facts, and you can jump in on this too, if you know. I always like to bring up some basic facts about the illness or subject we're starting with. So, can any, I don't know if you guys know, first uh, day of school, orphan drugs, maybe you can explain here, how, what's the population uh, break for orphan, orphan illnesses? Oh, well. I think many of the, uh, how many people here are second and third year students? So they have heard my spiel already and we have our first year students here. And I, I'm always privileged to, to, to have an opportunity to, to chair FMS1 and, and try to um, you know, be engaged in these meaningful activities and try to humanize the material. Uh, I think as many of you have heard from my lectures, there's about 7,000 rare diseases that have been uh, known or cataloged uh, in the United States alone, and that typically a rare disease is defined as having less than somewhere on the order of 100,000 individuals or 10,000 individuals at any given time in the U.S. population. However, there's also categories of rare diseases called ultra-rare diseases, and that's the ones that are near and dear to my heart that I particularly study, where 
Uh, I study a disease where there's about only about 100 or 200 people in the United States who are living at any given point in time. But it's important to know that for rare diseases that the majority of uh, patients with rare diseases are, uh, are children. And only about 5% of rare diseases actually have a treatment associated with them. But I started going through the, uh, you know, through the, the FDA uh, logs and, saw, and tried to see what, were, what was considered to be a treatable rare disease. One of them is called botulism, you can imagine. There was, uh, many of them were childhood cancers, many of them were diseases where the, the treatment was actually largely palliative or not very effective, so it's a little bit of an exaggeration. But there are you know, many of them, such as we, I specifically cover enzyme replacement therapy because I know that is an amazing clinical correlate uh, that is also has just, uh, as a result of basic science knowledge, has improved people's lives. All right. As far as drugs, which I'm sure you're involved with, there are currently 552 orphan drugs dealing with these things on the market. And Rosalind and I are lucky enough to be on some of those drugs, which is why we are above ground and here for you today. So along with Rosalind's work downstairs, which we're going to jump into right away, there's also work by some faculty and staff. We have work by Alexander March and Stephania Gambaroff. Is that, did I pronounce it right? So those are also downstairs for you. So Rosalind, a lot of the artwork, this, the second years know this for the first years. A lot of the work we show downstairs, it's all by artist patients that do work about their own illnesses. And a lot of the work, it's very literal. If somebody has MS, they might show their brain scans. If they have cystic fibrosis, they would do work about lungs. Your work is not, it's not so obvious that it comes from a place of illness. So maybe you could talk about how your illness gave you sort of creative force to make this work. And I'm gonna to move to the first slide. In one way, I didn't think at all about genetics or illness when I was doing my art. I was just doing my art. Um, I, was, I was actually diagnosed when I was just three, but I didn't know that I had Gaucher disease until I started having problems uh, heading into puberty. And it was then that my, my parents told me that I had a genetic disease, which really didn't it didn't mean so much. To, I didn't know what genetics are. It just was this thing that, that I had, that there was nothing to do about it because there was no treatment. So it was a kind of presentation of, well, everyone's got something wrong with them. This is what you have. Make the best of it. Be happy. Be creative. Be resourceful. And make your life as good as you can. Um, it wasn't that straightforward, but, but that, was, that, was the, that was the way it, it was presented to me. And so my parents were really um, determined that I should grow up normally, and they encouraged me in my art and in doing anything creative. So for me, art was not a cathartic process so much of, of expressing my pain or expressing immediate emotion of fear. It was, when I was young, it started out more like, like I, I did a lot of self-portraits. I did a lot of trees, because there were limbs. I did my hand. Because for me, um, the, the experience of Gaucher disease was really centered in mobility. And, um, and my issues, even though they were genetic-based, um, the way it manifested in my body was through, was through pain, through necrosis, um, through infarctions, where part of the bone would die. And that was amazingly painful, where you had to just go in the hospital and let it ride out. But then over time, it, it caused the bone to die. But anyway, I, I went to university. I went to art school. I, I was just doing my own thing. And it was really at a moment way later on um, when I did this piece that you're looking at that um, I called it uh, restructure number three, dead technology. And when I look back on that name, because I, I hadn't looked at that slide in a while, and I thought, wow, I was, I was thinking about that. And this was a pivotal piece for me, because it was the first time that I saw 
a kind of evidence of an internal process that was being articulated in a way that I didn't even realize that I had a voice to say. It, it was this art that came out. It, it could be an image that could say anything to anybody, but to me, it was about the breakdown. What I recognized was this is, this is what's happening in my body. Cells are breaking down, but they're not breaking down all the way. There's always something left over, and this is what's killing my bone. And, and, and it was like, okay, it can break down, break down, break down, but it's still never going away. This was before there was any treatment, this piece I did in 1985. But the thing that, that I still kind of, the reason I, I wanted to share this one was um, the idea that there's this voice, this inside voice of art as a language on its own that kind of presupposes thought and ideas that comes out in a very direct way and, and says something that I couldn't have had access to otherwise. But once I recognized it, I said, wow, there's, a, there's, a, there's another voice and I'm gonna pay attention to it. And it didn't happen all the time, but, but if I look at the course of my life through art, I could say that it's really guided me. I have more to say too, should I save it? Okay. You can say some now, or you can say when we show the slides. All right, well, I'll just say one more thing about, um, in terms of the overview. Um, so there's, there's ways that it came through in a direct way through, through this art language that, um, what I just described. But then there were also circumstances that, that having to deal with the situation became the kind of, um, the kind of pearl that grows in the oyster that you have to just deal with, and by dealing with it, it takes you through another moment, and, um, and actively getting through a difficulty sometimes has spurred me on to, to find a creative solution. Um, through my art, though, uh, visually, I've, I've, I've experienced a lot of issues that no matter what medium they are, they kind of come back around to mobility, emotion, structure and space, uh, freedom, a lot of issues about limitation and openness. Um, and there's more too that will, that will emerge, so. Okay, so we will look at some more of her slides and a lot of the work is, uh, we'll see, is also down in the gallery, but we also have a few that are not in the gallery. So, Doctor, when, when I look at this slide, this reminds me a lot of sort of the genetic charts when I was growing up. You know, the parents are on the top, the kids are down below. So I really sort of relate to this piece, whether that was her intent or not. To me, it looks very much like medical things I'd seen. So, that in mind, um, I always ask our, our expert to, to talk to the students about why, why you chose genetics. Because to me, genetics, especially in what you do with these orphan and small population uh, illnesses, you're more than just looking at genes. You have to worry about, like, I, I can use Rose, Lynn, and I as an example. There was ghettoization of the Jewish population in Europe, and then we moved to Jewish cities here, and you know, it's, it's almost like you have to be an investigator, a social investigator, not just a scientific investigator sometimes to sort of follow genetic trends where people move. So what, what interests you about being a genetics and it might interest them if they want to go into this as a career? No, that's a, that's a very deep question. I, <clears throat> as a child, I, I think I knew very early on, by the time I was probably four or five years old when I started hearing First thing about uh, genes and DNA and the fact that DNA was present in all living organisms and it was the blueprint of life, that, that really fascinated me and, and drove me. But I got into the rare disease world many years ago. Um, I, was, uh, I was interested a long time ago in human evolution and I was interested in what causes humans to have bigger brains and cause the upright locomotion and all those big you know, ivory tower types of scientific questions. 
And I started working with uh, the San Diego Zoo a long time ago, and I was getting blood samples from bonobos, chimps, gorillas, every type of primate you could ever imagine. So I was come from as, as uh, esoteric a point of view as possible, right? And then I was uh, measuring different types of lipids in their blood, and I was trying to relate that to diet and come up with these uh, hypotheses about how humans developed over the course of millions of years. And as a result of this, I got tied in with an investigator over at Johns Hopkins by the name of Hugo Mosier. Hugo Mosier was actually popularized by this movie, Lorenzo's Oil, about another rare disease called X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. And I was working with him for a few years, and his wife, Anne, told me, he says, Joe, why don't you go to this United Leukodystrophy Foundation meeting in DeKalb, Illinois? And I said, you can meet patients that have these uh, disorders in peroxisomes, which is a compartment within the cell that uh, I was uh, kind of interested in from a basic science point of view. And I remember the, uh, in a journey, I was going in from, uh, I think, O'Hare Airport, driving to a place called uh, DeKalb, Bill, Illinois, two and a half hours away. And they had a car that I was uh, sharing a ride with, with a father whose uh, son was born deaf and blind with broken bones. And he was uh, you know, severe intellectual disabilities. I know his, his mother died. His, his wife's uh, father just recently died. And he was uh, telling me about end-of-life decisions with his, uh, with his son. And, he was, uh, and we were talking about this, and I was realizing this was a no-win situation. No matter what he decided, people were going to judge this man. And I remember, um, as, I, as I tell the students, when I was a graduate student myself, my mom was very ill with uh, breast cancer. And we were very much blessed that my mom was able to tell us what she wanted to, what types of medical interventions she wanted. And we were able to honor that particular uh, wishes. But in that case, with a, a person who has a son who's dying as an infant, and you know, like, how did he know what would be the right thing to do? And it really very much touched me. And then I went to, uh, I went to the meeting, and I met so many people in this hotel, which had so many families who uh, were dramatically affected by, these, by this very severe disease. And I met uh, a parents, Ann Park and Matt Hopkins, who I know this day live in Atlanta, Georgia, and they have a son, Peter Hopkins. And Peter Hopkins was about four years old at the time, and the parents, Ann Park and Matt, told me that they knew that their son was going to die in about a year. But they wanted no one to ever have to go through that. And that touched me, because I remember how it was with my mother. And I promised them that I would dedicate the rest of my research career to try to build communities, to try to try to find better interventions for, for their son and for other, other people who are affected by this disease. So, you know, to this day, I mean, their son did die about a year later. Ann Park and Matt are very uh, close to my heart. I go to their, um, their walkathons every year that they hold in honor of their, their son, Peter. And I try to advocate. And one of the uh, quotes that I love is from Helen Keller. And Helen Keller had this quote that, Alone, we could do so little. Together, we could do so much. And it was my realization that when I run a lab of just a few people and students in my lab, you know, what is the type of impact can I really have on human life? Can we really deliver something for these families? And then it just dawned on me. It's really reaching out, awareness, reaching out to other scientists who have been developing technologies for other rare diseases. So I'm very active in drug screening world, in the gene therapy world. And I have met so many amazing people in my life. I'm very blessed to, uh, to have taken that career path. And I also feel very blessed to be able to tell the medical students here. And I think of all 7,000 rare diseases out there and how there's, it's overwhelming when you think of the number of good causes and, and, and out there, and how can we all try to, and how can one person be able to address all of them? And, and the real blessing, as you realize, is that every one of you is a point of light out there, and every one of you is going to affect human life, and already has. And, and just raising awareness, and that's the reason why I like to show videos when I teach. I like to bring a human face to this, so it's not just a USMLE step one question that's a one of a billion facts you've got to memorize, but to see the humanity of it, and that's why I'm blessed and uh, I love being able to sit here with you two up on stage and thank you Dr. Schaff for that honor. All right well back to the humanity of it and that is you Rosalind so why don't you tell us about this piece and how the the structural part starts working its way into your artwork. Okay this piece is called stages 
and uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of art through the years and a lot of different series and so these are key moments and to try and extract it out of the story without telling you like 400 paragraphs of what came before and after. That's <laughs> um, to be succinct. I had gone through a period of a lot of surgeries at the time I made this. I'd had um, a hip replacement, a surface replacement, my gallbladder, another hip replacement, and then uh, this one failed and it was redone. And, but also, treatment started. So it was a big time of my life that suddenly, the first time ever, it was, it was like, like the road was open. There was, there was, there was a whole other way of, of living my life that was becoming possible. So this, this is really about different, um, it's, there's, 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 a, there's two anatomical figures. One is a child and one is a fish. So it's kind of like the consciousness and the unconsciousness. There's the structure that is like energy that becomes structure, that becomes form, and then that deconstructs back down like to a structure of light, and then light, and then the void. So it's a kind of statement about evolution and death and rebirth but in all these different stages and kind of cycling back around. All right, so another series you're working on, and again, let's talk about how this relates to your own personal structure and integrity of your bones. Mm -hmm. Somehow you started working at Caltech with an electron microscope, is that right, where was it? No, it was Seal Labs. Seal was, Labs, yeah. anyway, you can explain it better than me because you know what you're talking about. Uh, a, a really good friend of mine was a microscopist, and one day I, I was saying to him, I want to see what something looks like in an electron microscope. So he said, okay, bring something, and come Sunday. And that morning I found a dead bee on my windowsill, and I thought, oh, well, I love bees. That'll be good to look at. And so that was, that was the first thing I looked at. And when he took me through... Uh, the sampling of it, the preparation, and zoomed in. I was just, I was awestruck when I saw the compound eye, because I looked at it and I thought, oh my God, that looks like honeycomb. So there, this, this connection between the structure of the bee's vision and the structures that she's creating, that they were both a hexagonal form, to me, I don't know, it, it just was one of those aha moments. And first I thought, I wonder if there's any kind of influence of the structure of the eye and the structure of the forms that she builds. And I asked entomologists about it, and they just went, no. It's just if you take a bunch of circles and squash them together, you're going to get hexagons. It's just nature's efficient use of space. But for me, it was, it was a really major inspiration because I thought, I wonder how it's relevant to us if, if there's a kind of patterning or encoding that at some level there, like the golden mean, that you can take a form and it will self-recur at different scales, but it always has the same essence. And, and for me, it, it spoke to the idea that, that there's a correlation between perception and action, a vision and action, that, that, that I can't create anything other than how I'm structured. Not that my eye is going to be hexagons and I'm going to build honeycomb, no. But that, but that what I do comes out of some kind of intrinsic structuring or encoding that, um, that I wondered if that had something to do with DNA. So it made me really, you know, like, is there, not, not about the bee and the eye specifically, but, but the idea of instruction and encoding and different levels of, of something that comes through. Um, and, and so this became a theme for me that I explored backwards and forwards and, and kept going. But maybe that's a good time to yeah, so ask it, you are there any what you have to say about Intrinsic that, really. <laughs> uh, patterning in your genetics you'd like to compare this to? Like when you talk about instruction. All right, when you talk about instruction, one thing you don't know about me is that I give many hours of medical lectures. 
And one thing that I infuse into all my lectures is puns. So what I'm doing right now is I'm filtering away all the bee puns that are going through my mind, <laughs> because my level of sophistication isn't, uh, isn't all that high outside of my little nerdy little world of science. <laughs> but when uh, some of the words that, uh, as I was listening and I was thinking a little bit about it, and I was thinking the, the beauty of uh, just the, the, the patterning of the, of, the, of the eye and like and something that you would just walk, uh, you just, you, you, you take it for granted, you know? You're, you're not, you're, there's so much beauty around us and you know, and then you're seeing on a microscopic level that here is something that is really quite wondrous and now you could visualize. It also tells me with basic science, sometimes I, I'm a bit of a reformed academic, sometimes I wonder if why, why are we funding some of this basic science when in fact I'm not even sure where this is gonna go in the clinic. But then there's going to be these wonderful discoveries such as CRISPR, this gene editing technology, which is like a paragon of a technology that came out as a result of basic science, right? And then basic science questions. And so as a, as a researcher, I don't expect any kind of given project to necessarily pay off to that level to, to actually potentially have a, a transformative effect on, on research as well as on human life. And, a lot of us are just kind of struggling along and we, you know, we're, we're kind of poking our way and sometimes things will work, sometimes they don't work. But this is a reminder of you know, what you know, kind of inspired me as a child. That was these types of questions were the ones about uh, what, what encodes a, an eye? Why is it the, the DNA is also present in a plant and in a human and in a bee eye? And it's really quite wondrous, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Well. So as I went forward with my inspiration from this shape, um, I, was, I was creating these, these perspectives and I had a lot of, of physical constraint and, and I realized that, and this came again, it was something that came after the fact. I didn't start out doing the artwork this way, but by using by using um, a restricted pattern and putting it into perspective, I realized that I could create a vast expanse of space and that at some level I was creating my own, my own freedom. That it came out of a need of, of something that I didn't have and so there was the urge, I think there's an urge that we all have towards wholeness and towards, towards, um, towards life, the, the fullness of it. And, and so, so I was making these patterns and going into perspective. This uses the same pattern of the hexagon, and um, even though it has an illusion of a cube, but I was playing with the idea of deconstructing the forms again, but, but going into perspective. And with this one, um, I used the, the actual images I shot of the bee. There's honeycomb above and the bee eye below. Um, and, and I was also really creating a sense of space and place that I saw come through my work um, over and over again, whether it was through microscopy or through painting um, or through photography, that there, there's a, a, a placement. And then this one evolved into this one. And this is what I was starting to say before, that the inspiration of the B and the I um, I introduced my own mutation into that and, and decided to do a random pattern. In homage to the bee, I started out with doing that same hexagon that, well, the hexagon is the contour of a cube. And so I was making these cubes, but then thinking about the bee and the hexagon. But then instead of doing a rigid pattern that was constructing an illusion of space, I decided to just randomize it and, and see what happened. And this was after, after all these hip replacements and I had another level of mobility and, and freedom inside my own body. And when I stood back and looked at it, I was just kind of like, wow, this looks like the desert. This, this really does look like a place. And at that point, I was in the desert, I was doing a, an artist residency. But in a way, it was answering the question I had posed, because I was seeing that, that in many years along the way, I was using this pattern, and, and it was representing, once again, 
a kind of internal reality that I went from, from constraint into, um, into movement and rhythm. And it was alive in me, and it was showing up through my work. But it was also a kind of after-the-fact realization. OK, we're going to move through these a little faster. Fine. Um, so why don't you talk about these, these I think. The bone? Oh, yes. I think you guys who all were into internal now, why don't you? OK. So a lot of the work that I did was symbolic. And, um, but along the way, in between um, the second hip failing and getting revised, I got a piece of it. And, and having a little piece of my bone was really crazy to have access to this. And I looked at it through scanning electron microscope, and I did a whole series of these images. And, um, and I, I went back through, through the years over time and did more and more. Um, and it, it, was, it was this big moment for me, because this was directly my bone, directly my disease, like looking at it and going, wow, these are so beautiful, these cells and this, and this, this bone, this place. But, but within, within these are the culprits of, of my demise. It was like, like there's, these were sort of mug shots within, <laughs> within family photos, in a way. Because I knew that, that these were, there were Gaucher cells in here, and that the very Gaucher cells that gave me access to be able to see this, this beauty, was, it was because of demise. It was because of destruction. And that, that tension between finding beauty within the, the um, ramifications of disaster and personal catastrophe was a really strange and interesting tension for me. Um, and this, this, I believe, is a Gaucher cell. And the process of dealing with this and looking at something head on saying, well, this, this, this is something that this tiny enzyme that is, is slightly mutated, that doesn't produce enough, um, enough em enzyme to digest, the, to chemically get rid of these cells, and, and then there's a lipid. And, and this, is, this is a malformed cell. And this, these, like, to just face it head on was really intense. Um, and important, and and to say, well, how how do I how do I reconcile this this um, the disintegrity of the integrity of the art and the disintegrity of the substance that is behind it? Because this is me, this is my life, and it's been a, a an important process to go through that. And this this is the bone itself. So these are all bone and blood, and this one is like for me a, a path. It's like this going into this unknown place. It made me think a lot about Hansel and Gretel and, and that there's no way back, even when they leave a trail of crumbs because the birds eat them. And for me, it was, it was there was no going back. Once, the, once my hip failed, it was like the demise also not just of bone, but of a paradigm. It was, it was like, oh, things aren't all OK now. Things still. Shit happens still, you know, and I have to deal with it. And so the, that, that sense of path and place, and then there's mystery. So this is a sense of like the, the unknown that comes through and how you just have to face what is there and, and not know. So what I like about these last two is they, they look like landscapes, and you've yeah. got a, a tiny, tiny section of your hip, but it, once it's blown up, it it gives you a, like this vast imagery, which genetically, we're back to the doctor here, you look, you, you sort of look for one tiny mutation, but it has a gigantic ramification. Right, right. So in a way, you're the, the clinical example of what she's showing here. Yeah, and we're trying to come up with uh, a rational way of addressing just that one misspelling. And one, one factoid I always like to tell uh, families when I talk to them with uh, who have the children with uh, this paroxysomal disorder I study is that we all, 
we all carry, if it's a uh, uh, Mendelian disorder and it's recessive, we all carry about 20 to 30 glitches in our genomes. And it doesn't matter who you are, if you're, uh, you could be the, the world's greatest athlete or just an ordinary person on the street like myself, or you could be, um, you just, we all can, we all, we all have this in, in our, in our bodies. And in the case of a rare disease, they're rare because there's just going to be just by, by sheer chance that there are going to be two people who happen to have a glitch in the exact same gene and they're going to have a child. And then if the child has uh, the two glitches in there for, uh, for mom and dad, they develop this disorder. So that's something that I always like to uh, tell parents because I, not to be off topic, but I also I find many parents feel that they have guilt because they passed on a, a, a gene that had a, had a glitch on it to their child and they feel they were somehow responsible for, for their child's uh, disease. And it's, it's very sad for me. And what I like to do though is be able to try to use some of the basic science knowledge we have to at least try to address that, to try to humanize this and to recognize that it's part of our shared humanity and we're here to you know, reach out and you know, help each other. Great. So, Rosalind, this is the, the last series. We're coming up on the end here. So why don't you talk about this series and sort of the rammed, and again, we're sort of pulling this back to genetics. These are all the same things, but the images are very random. So why don't you tell us what we're looking at here? Okay. I, I got into looking at tears and through the microscope. And I worked on this series over a period of about eight years, and I was looking at uh, most, of, most of the samples were my own. I was the best subject because I was always willing <laughs> to save a tear while I was crying. And I was prepared and I was really curious. And, and so over the course of eight years, I was able to save a, a very wide range of emotion. Um, the ones I selected to show here are, are in relation to having Gaucher disease in one way or another. and. Um, and the patterns that come through, they, were, they all seem to have their own signature. Um, I, it wasn't a scientifically controlled study, but there were two ways I did it. One was more methodical than the other. Um, I either air dried them or I compressed them between a glass and a slip cover. And, um, and I saw that the viscosity of the tear made some difference and there were a lot of variables. But the, the, the reason I'm sharing these is the first one, um, this one, is it wasn't emotion. It was, it, was, um, it was after surgery. It was, I was being worked on by a therapist and, and she moved my leg in a certain way and suddenly I started crying and I said, grab a slide. I wanna see what this one looks like. Because it wasn't, I said, I'm not feeling sad about this. It's, it's like my body is crying. And, and I realized that there was a kind of trauma that has been trapped in, in me, that, that, that it has a memory. It's like my body has a memory of a lot of really hard things that, that it went through. And this was coming out. And, and so it was fascinating to me to be able to see a, uh, an image that spoke to, to that. Um, the middle one has to do with, with, with getting through a crisis that when you have to soldier through something, you just get through it. And how I know it's true for probably all of us that often after the fact, after a, a, there's a resolution, that's when all this emotion starts coming out. That's when sometimes we get depressed or because it's, it's like now... Now there's a, a, a relaxation and, and a lot of suppressed emotion comes through. And the third one, the patterns are so different. This, that one had to do with overwhelm and kind of saturation and depletion. Um, and seeing how these, these different patterns emerged, you know, it made me really curious. Well, what, because the reason I started this project in the first place had to do with the question, well, would all emotion look the same? Would grief look like joy if, if we could see it? Like, what does a tear really look like? And then seeing that each one had its own kind of story and its own kind of structure um, just made me more curious, but um, there's, 
there's tons more to say about that, but you have another unfortunately, question. We, <laughs> unfortunately, we only have like five yeah. minutes left. So if anybody has a question, you can go to the microphones up here. And in the meantime, we're going to look at the last image, which sort of gets back to the bee and the structure. Yeah, in a way. The, the, the ones that I compressed between slide and slip cover, those, um, those had a more random effect in a way because there wasn't just the air evaporating of the, of the chemistry of the tear, but there was also the physics of it spreading out, its flow, and, and the linear shapes that it created. And sometimes it was such a surprise to look at an image and see how the image of my tear spoke back to me about the emotion or the condition or the situation that provoked the tear in the first place. And this was after um, I, uh, this hip failed once again, so I had the hip number three done um, back in 2015. And so those other ones that I showed you were from that same surgery. And at the end, when, when I got the all clear and I could walk again, I could just get back into my life, it was such a relief. And, and this one I call, I made it. And, and then when I looked at it, I went, oh my god, this looks just like a pelvis, doesn't it? It's like a hip. And how crazy is that, that this was about my hip, and then it looks like a hip. I mean, where does that come from? And that wasn't isolated. It, it happened that way. And so it brings to my mind that there's, no matter how much fact and figure and, and science there is, there's also mystery. There's also what we can't know yet um, until we have a technology to, to quantify things that maybe we only sense at our periphery. But for me, this, um, yeah, it speaks back to that kind of magic, that kind of not knowing and, and having to abide in not knowing at the same time that, um, that there's always more and more and more knowledge and information that becomes available. Are there any questions for anybody? Yes, I'm um, curious, Rosalind, you mentioned um, just very briefly that treatment became available. Mm -hmm. And um, and I know Ted has shared his story about his, you know, the, the life, you know, that he didn't expect to have when NIH funded research allowed his um, gauche to be treated. And I wondered if you could just speak briefly to, and maybe Ted as well, to what uh, change in your artistic output there was at, around that time. What change there was in my artistic output? Mm -hmm. Well, that was, um, I started treatment in 1991, and, and so that's when there was, my landscapes got really expansive, and, um, and it wasn't just going out to the edge of, of a perspective in space, but I started exploring other levels. So it was like other states of, of consciousness became available to me to explore. So it wasn't just like, um, space that way, but it was different levels and nuances, and um, and then that morphed into the kind of more undulation, and um, and I think it like over time it made me curious about looking directly microscopically at things too, um, because also. Around that time, I, I saw the film Powers of Ten. Do any of you know about that, that film from Charles and Ray Eames? Yeah, it's so incredible because it shows, it starts with a people, it goes um, one meter, 10 meters, powers of 10, all the way to 10 to the 24th, all the way out into cosmos, way beyond. Back, 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 back. And then it keeps going all the way to the inner space, 10 to the negative 24th, all the way down to the carbon atom. And so that continuum of opening up, that, that becoming aware of that, and then within my own body, I was beginning to have this other sense of, of possibility and hope. So there was a lot of correlation. But then in my case, it was right after that that my hip, my hip um, failed. And so it was like, like this shattering of a paradigm because I really thought, okay, I'm all clear now. Now it's, it's great. And, and so that's where there was this huge mistrust of my body. Like I cannot count on my own structure to uphold me. And, and that, that kind of process put me through all kinds of other things through my art that, 
are, are complex. It's another conversation. But it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, and in my case, I did a lot of work about myself because you think about yourself a lot when you were sick, and then once the new treatment came along, I started doing work about other people. So before we end, I just want to say, if you're interested in Rose Lynn's work about the bees or the tears, she has books, and you can scan there to get to get to those. It's our little sales pitch. Um, I just want to thank Rose um, Lynn for sharing your work and your story and for Dr. Casey for sharing your expertise. I, um, I love yeah. that um, one, in one conversation here, we understand so much about um, both the, the science and the humanity um, of this um, condition. And thanks, Ted, for making it happen. Thanks.